just know that my doctor, after it was all said and done, she said out of the 3,600 babies that she had delivered throughout her 20 plus year career, she had never had a scenario like what happened to me. So... Welcome back to my channel. My name is Caitlin and I run the blog called Mrs. Midwest, which you're probably aware of if you click this video because today we are diving into my personal life. We will be discussing or I will be sharing, telling the story of my two births, both in 2021. Yes, I gave birth to two babies in one year in 2021. It was the craziest thing that has ever happened to me, but the Lord sustained me. He brought me through. I'm only a little over a year postpartum from my first baby and I've already had a second one and everybody's healthy. Everybody's doing great. I've been debating. I've been debating for a long time sharing my birth stories. It is a difficult negative kind of birth story. It, it gets a little scary at times and I really didn't want to scare any pregnant women. I didn't want to scare first time moms. But the more I've thought about it, the more I realized that it's good to have a variety of birth stories online because the truth is most of us, most of you, um, pregnant women, women who have not yet had kids, women who are still having kids, you're going to have a great birth. That's pretty standard and straightforward. Um, it's, it's going to be beautiful and not scary and you'll be fine. And going into this, just know that my doctor, after it was all said and done, she said out of the 3,600 babies that she had delivered throughout her 20 plus year career, she had never had a scenario like what happened to me. So that is going to be the introduction. So what is my first birth? So I got pregnant after almost a year of trying with my husband, with my beautiful son, Bodhi. And it was a pretty good pregnancy. I had typical symptoms, nausea in the first trimester, nesting in the second, and then in the third, I had a little bit of pain, but it was really, really great. January, 2021, I went into labor without realizing it because contractions, you guys may have heard of Braxton Hicks contractions, which are kind of warning you that labor's coming. And then there's traditional contractions where it feels like your uterus is squeezing down on itself. I did not experience um, traditional contractions. I just had upper back pain. And so what happened is I was getting, I was two weeks away from my due date. I was 38 weeks and I started having upper back pain and I could not get comfortable. I couldn't get comfortable lay laying down, laying on my side, sitting, reclining. I just could not get comfortable. And what I had thought happened is because I have mild scoliosis, I thought with my really big, heavy baby, like hanging off the front of my body and I was at the end of pregnancy, I, I started to think, oh, well, maybe my back's just giving out. Like, um, I had been warned that pregnancy with scoliosis can sometimes be difficult. So I thought, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's just my back. I don't know. But then after a couple days of that, like where I could barely sleep and I was just lounging around, it was horrible. I started to notice a little bit of more liquid than usual, if you know what I mean. And it wasn't like the movies, you know, in the movies when people's water break and it's just like all over the floor. And oftentimes if you, if you know anybody who's given birth, sometimes your water doesn't break at all and the doctor breaks it for you or whatever. What happened to me is called a high leak water rupture. So it's where you get like a small breakage in your amniotic sac where the baby is. And so you're leaking amniotic fluid, but it's just a slow trickle. So you kind of like don't realize that your water has broken. And so all those factors combined, I had about like a day and a half half with that and I started to just think this is weird so I called my doctor's office and they they were like oh my goodness you need to come in we need to check to see if that liquid is amniotic fluid or if it's just normal pregnancy like getting ready for birth um and while you're here we'll do a non-stress test and bring your hospital bags oh okay it's time and I guess you could say my mindset going into the hospital was excitement. I just felt like this warrior mindset. I was made to do this. I'm a woman. Like I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared of birth, which really surprised me because growing up, I was really scared of birth. I never wanted to watch any birth videos ever. I never wanted to even hear people's birth stories. And I was excited to meet my baby. So we pack up the bags, we go to the hospital and they get me into like the OB triage where they check the fluid and they run labs on it to see if it's amniotic and then they check to see if you're having contractions and I was like there's no way I'm having contractions I have not felt anything in my uterus 
But lo and behold, we get the test back. They hooked me up to the monitor to read the contractions. And I was having contractions and I was already dilated too. They checked that. I was having contractions. I think they were five or four minutes apart. My baby was occupant posterior. Usually the baby, you want their back to be facing the front of your belly. So their face and their hands and their feet are all like towards your spine. And that makes for the best exit out of your body. And what happened with me and Bodhi, his face and his hands and his feet and all of that were facing the front of my stomach. And that's called occupant posterior and it can cause severe back labor. And so I was going through back labor and with a posterior baby, your labor is usually sometimes multiple days before the baby descends. You're kind of in for like a longer birth experience. They get us into the room and I labor throughout the night and around 7 a.m. the next morning, you know, I've been laboring all night. My contractions were getting a lot closer together. I had dilated a little bit, but I was feeling really exhausted because I hadn't realized it, but I had been laboring at home with that back pain for multiple days. So by 6 a.m. the next morning, I was just exhausted. I wanted the epidural, um, but the epidural didn't end up working. It didn't like set in correctly or something. And then the anesthesiologist was busy all day with other emergency C-sections and stuff. I guess it was just what you call a failed epidural. So I ha continued to labor and I finally dilated to a 10, like I was ready to push active labor, let's go around 1 p.m. And so 1 p.m., we're ready to push, I'm so excited. <laughs> My doctor comes in, we do some practice pushes, and then she got pulled into an emergency C-section. There was a woman who had attempted a breach home birth and had gotten transferred to the hospital, so they had to attend to that person because her baby's life was on the line, as was her own. You know, they stuck me with a nurse midwife, and I wasn't super comfortable with that. I really, for my first birth especially, wanted to be with a doctor. But I was like, you know what? We are at the pushing stage. We are in active labor. It's just going to be hopefully less than two hours and I'll meet my baby. Um, and things did not go that way. What happened is in active labor with pushing, we, we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. And like I said, my baby was OP. So he was in a non-ideal um, position. So with the pushing, we tried different positions. We tried me pushing with like a peanut ball, like it's kind of like a yoga ball. We tried standing, we tried all fours, we did a birthing stool, one leg, one up, one down. And and one hour goes by, and then a second hour goes by, and I am exhausted. Active labor, pushing, laboring for a few days, no sleep the night before, and I start vomiting. And I did not want food when I was laboring, and I'm really glad I didn't eat a lot because I just started vomiting like all the liquids that I had taken up. So I think, yeah, about an hour and a half, two hours into pushing, I just started puking everywhere. And I start to get kind of worried, and I'm like, where's my doctor? I don't know, I just, I need to take a break. And this was a moment that I wish had never happened to me. The nurse midwife and the nurse, I started to be like, I need a break. I don't know if I can do this. This is just not working. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I, I don't know what's going on. Why am I not making progress? And they just kind of like came up into my face and they were like, you can do it. Your body was made for this. Don't give up. You can do it. And I didn't realize this till later, but that moment was extremely traumatizing to me because I was doing absolutely everything I could have done to push that baby out. I was open to absolutely any advice on what position was going to help him, you know, get down the canal. And he was just stuck. And it was, it started to become so painful because he, w he was kind of making his way down like a little bit and, and, but not like he, he wasn't like getting pushed out. And so the nurse midwife is like, okay, I have one more position I want you to try. Um, this got another woman's sunny side up baby to flip. So just lay back. So I laid back on the bed and it was a birthing bed. So those like hospital beds, the bottom half, like can lower so that everyone can get at you like when you're giving birth and so she's like okay so we're gonna be here and then I'm gonna lower the bottom of the bed and just as I'm doing that bear down on a contraction and push and again because I at this point still was not having traditional contractions in my uterus we had to look at the monitor at the contraction reader to even know when I was having like a contraction because I it just there was no relief it was just like 10 out of 10 pain 
the entire time. And that's a, another weird thing with back labor. And, and that's why I haven't told you guys this story because I don't want to scare anybody out of birth. But, you know, this is what happened to me. And so I'm in that position. She lowers the bed and I let out like a blood curdling scream. That was the most agonizing pain I have ever experienced in my life. I've never broken a limb. But if I, if I, I imagine that that's what that would have felt like. It felt like my body was breaking in half, like my spine was breaking in half. And I think it's because where she lowered it, like my baby was so jammed in there and my back was so on fire and then lowered the bed and it like further caused pain. And that was my limit. No, I'm not pushing anymore. Get away from me. Something flipped in my brain where I just suddenly felt before I was like so focused on the baby. Let's have this incredible experience but after that severe pain and not getting any relief from pain for hours and hours and and also no progress no progress at all I just yeah something broke in me and then I I feel like I went outside my body into a survival mode and I remember they they came up to me they're like you're okay you're okay we'll we'll just take a quick break and then we'll keep going and I remember like clawing up the side the guardrail things on the side of the hospital bed clawing up away from everybody and sobbing and screaming no I can't like I, I need a break I can't do this I want to see my doctor something's wrong I need pain relief anything <laughs> and I just said I will not push anymore until I get an epidural because like I said I was getting no breaks from the pain it wasn't traditional labor it wasn't like breathe through it and then <laughs> take up take 30 seconds off and then breathe through it it was just like a 10 of pain and then with these added positions to try to get Bodhi to flip it was like an 11 or 12 out of 10 of pain. And so I, I, and again, I kind of started to just not be myself. It shifted and I just started, it. I, it's not like I forgot about my baby, but all of a sudden survival was like the top of my focus. I need to survive. And the number one priority in that moment I had was like pain relief, like get the baby out or give me an epidural and I'll get him out. Like I just needed some sort of solution so I could keep going. And like I said, the anesthesiologist and my doctor were wrapped up in emergency C-section. And so it was just like a crazy day um, in my hospital. And I had originally chosen my hospital because it was low intervention. And they were super baby friendly, mom focused. Like I said, laboring in the tub, moving during labor. If I had wanted to eat during labor, I could have. And all these different positions and I wasn't hooked up to machines. I could like freely move. And all of that is great when you are having a traditional, healthy, straightforward birth. But when something takes a turn like it did with me, I wanted nothing more than my doctor. And I wanted nothing more than medicine at that moment. And so, this is kind of the part, I, w I don't want to say blacked out, <laughs> but I definitely, it's blurry. After she lowered that hospital bed and that thing in my psyche just snapped, it's blurry. So what ended up happening is my nurse ran out of the room to get nitrous oxide, which is also known as laughing gas. It was all they had to offer me because the anesthesiologist was busy. My doctor was busy um, with surgery. The weird thing about nitrous oxide is you can still feel all of the pain, but you process it differently. So I could still feel all of my pain, but it was like my brain didn't care as much about it. So I had the nitrous and then we just decided, I think it was decided that we were going to wait for my doctor. And we had sent the midwife. We were like, hey, can you, the nurse midwife, hey, can you please go let her know that we are stalling, that this isn't working, the pushing is not working, we want a second opinion, we want her to look at things, um, we need help essentially. So I'm hooked up on the nitrous and the next chunk of this story is my husband's perspective because I could not give you a play-by-play -play of those next couple hours if I tried because it is so blurry. I kind of don't even remember it. I was so disassociated with myself, my body, the situation. I had completely forgotten about the baby at that point. I just felt like I was dying. And according to my husband, I was saying things like that, like murmuring like C-section, C-section, or I, I think I'm dying. And like, why aren't you guys helping me? Why are you just watching me suffer? Like, 
wow, I guess <laughs> I was laying it on thick, I guess. But, you know, after my birth, a couple days later, I had realized I had bruises all over my body and I had a large cut on my nose because I had been smashing that nitrous oxide face mask onto my face so hard to get away from pain, the pain. And I had um, been writhing around on the bed like trying to push intermittently um while also just like screaming and crying and i know this just sounds so dark and like this is why i have not shared my birth story but please know like this is not common this is not common and so i was just pushing and pushing and pausing and i uh, my husband said too i would have moments like every like so often where i would look at the I would like open up my eyes with the mask and I'd look at him and her, my nurse and I'd say, I'm going to push this baby out. And then I'd like give it like a bunch of pushes and nothing. And so pretty, pretty bleak. It got to the point where two hours of that had gone by. And like I said, that's why I had all those bruises. And my husband finally, he finally snaps and he looks at the nurse. And at that point, the midwife had disappeared and then just never come back. And he looks at the nurse and he says, is this normal? You've been a nurse, she had said, for 20 years in the delivery room. Is this normal? What can we do? And she said that in her 20 years, she had never been in a situation like this. She didn't know where the doctor was. She didn't know why the doctor hadn't come at the last time after the, the midwife left to go get her. And my husband looks at her and he's like, do I need to take her to a hospital with the doctor? Do I need to throw her in my truck? Because I will. Do I need to call an ambulance? Because I will. And that kind of scared the nurse. <laughs> and so she said, I never do this, um, but I'm going to leave you unattended so I can go find the doctor myself. So she runs out. She finds my doctor, my darling, beloved OB, who, <laughs> who was with me before we conceived Bodhi. Like she was with me the whole time, all my appointments, and she was on call that day. And apparently she was just doing paperwork in her office because the midwife, the nurse midwife had failed to communicate the gravity of the situation. So when she comes in the room, this is all from my husband's perspective because I think I legit blacked out at this point. I don't remember hearing any of this. She apparently comes into the room and she's horrified. And she sees me and she like looks at the clock. It is past 6 p.m. I had been pushing since around noon, 12.45, and she thought I would have had my baby by now. She had no idea what was going on. So there was some sort of break in the communication. I don't know specifically what happened, but essentially she was extremely angry. <laughs> and at that point, apparently I, um, before I kind of just like stopped talking altogether, I had been like requesting a c-section like begging for one like get the baby out get the baby out because at that, that point I just felt like I can't get the baby out I've given this my all for hours in every single position that they told me to and I was happy and calm and so like like peaceful going into pushing like it there was nothing more I could have done and so she starts prepping everybody and so when I had closed my eyes after getting the nitrous I had seen um the nurse midwife in my face the nurse and then my husband and when I opened them again two hours later after my doctor appeared everybody was in operating room scrubs my husband was decked out in scrubs there was a doctor an anesthesiologist a pediatrician a baby nurse, like a NICU nurse, and two delivery nurses. And they had also had shift change while I was blacked out. And so I didn't recognize like anybody other than my doctor and my husband. And there was like this nurse right here. She was so sweet. She was like clutching my shoulder and she's like, it's going to be okay. We're going to help you. And I started like tearing up because I had felt when I was like writhing around in pain and asking like, why is no one helping me? It just felt like I was being left to just push the baby out. You'll get there eventually. But I felt like, no, <laughs> like I can't do this anymore. Like my body has done everything it can't. Like I need assistance. And like I said at the top of this video, most women don't need assistance in birth. Like they, they will just push the baby out, you know. This is very rare. And so <laughs> they... um 
I still had my nitrous and the anesthesiologist was like prepping things for the c-section and he I, someone had like propped me up and taken my hand to sign the consent form because I was so just like couldn't move essentially yeah because I was still in pain I was still like mentally blacking out at that point I yeah I had completely forgotten about the baby and it just was about like how am I going to survive this day I I feel like I'm dying and so someone had me sign the consent form I get the spinal and I cannot tell you guys how much of a relief it was to be numbed from that from that pain um, I was, I, I was so dramatic, I guess I had looked at the anesthesiologist after the numbness started spreading and I said like, where were you? Where were you all these hours? And I was like crying. And so they got the spinal and then I hear my doctor, I hear her say to somebody else, I feel like I could vacuum him out. I see his head. And I heard that and I paused and I said, do it, vacuum him out. And so it's again really really blurry like I don't really remember the timing of this all but all of a sudden everyone was around me and we were all like bearing down together <laughs> and pushing like I think it took like 10 or 15 more pushes with the assistance of the vacuum and she's getting him out and then his shoulder gets stuck my son has big shoulders and that was so scary and so she she quickly asked me for consent for an episiotomy and I was like do it like do whatever you have to do to save my baby because at that point I kind of like remembered the baby again <laughs> because I had gotten the numbing and I was like back on focus like we're giving birth and so they um she does the episiotomy they get him out they whip him up on my belly and I'll never forget the first time I saw my son it was the back the top of his head was facing me and we had, we had planned on doing delayed cord clamping, um, golden hour, all this stuff if you've given birth or looked into birth plans. Like, it's just so lovely and beautiful, these birth plans. Um, but we didn't get to do any of that because he they lay him on my belly, my deflated belly. And I remember seeing him, like, bounce like this and hit the whole top of his head. Like, he was gray and the whole top of his head was like, it was, it was like he was scalped almost. It was... So, like I'm gonna cry thinking about it and so they whip him over there was like this like little unit thing in the corner to work on the baby my son and the pediatrician just like gets to work his APGAR score was really low which is like how they measure how alive your baby is essentially like breathing and all of that and he didn't cry right away but I had given it all and at the time, my doctor was furiously sewing me up because I had, I had almost started to hemorrhage. She was trying to prevent that. And then he cried. And I, I don't remember the next moments. Like, everybody just left the room at some point. Like, I remember someone mopping up the blood. Like, when we got home a couple days later, I, like, noticed there was, like, blood on the bottom of my husband's pants and like I was shaking so much apparently like whenever someone offered for me to hold my son like I was just shaking from all the from the spinal medication and I just said like no like give him like I want him to be with his dad because it felt like I was so broken like it felt like I was so broken in that moment like I just had to come back to myself before I could be a mother to my child and it felt like he would be safer with my husband and at the time too I didn't quite understand what had happened to me so I thought it was my fault like I thought my body had failed me and I really like believed a lot of that those birth posts where it's like your body was made for this women have done this for thousands of years instrumental like medicalized birth is bad and like all this stuff so I thought like I had failed my baby and I felt like a horrible mother and I just wasn't myself and it wasn't until I think 24 or 36 hours later in the hospital where I kind of came to I got food and sleep and I held my son and we nursed and did skin to skin. It took a while after after the birth to feel better. And then I was just so shell-shocked and we went home and it was just really, really hard, really hard on me. 
<laughs> and then I, I had a couple influencers I was following at the time who went into labor like a week after me um, and they shared their birth stories. And our birth stories were exactly similar up until the point of pushing. And then I was reading like this Instagram caption and she's like, we started to push at 10 a.m. And 20 minutes later, after 15 pushes, I pushed out my bundle of joy. And I just started to feel so confused and resentful. And I just didn't understand. I thought I must be like the worst pusher in the world. I must have not prepared properly for birth. I, I don't understand what happened. I don't. I don't get it and the whole time too my baby had a giant head wound on his head so I was constantly having to worry about Billy Rubin and all this other stuff and it was so hard it was a it was an extremely difficult start to motherhood and that's why I I just took so much time off of YouTube um, and social media in general and I was just really ashamed I was so ashamed that I didn't have this awesome birth story like my friends I I would feel so confused whenever other people talked about birth and and it just took me a long time to piece everything together and something that really helped is my doctor ended up calling me and we talked on the phone and we talked through the birth and she was checking up on me and that's where she when she had told me out of the 3,600 births, like she had never had a situation like that. She described it as the perfect storm because there were so many other emergencies going on um, throughout the afternoon that my case, like they thought I was okay with the midwife. And I guess like the midwife nurse person, like she thought she could handle it too up until a certain point. And I learned, my doctor said I was one of her best pushers. Um, <laughs> that even like when I ended up getting the spinal and I was totally numb and couldn't feel anything. She's like, you were so strong and you had been pushing for so many hours and you did push that baby out. And like, it was just really like life-giving <laughs> to hear my doctor explain things to me, walk things through with me. And to realize I hadn't failed my baby, my body was not broken and it was his position um, but also my pelvis size, my pelvis shape that had caused such a bad situation. And she had eventually said that even if we had done the cesarean section, she probably would have had to vacuum him up the other way because he had gotten so stuck um, in the birth canal. And so either way, it was like there was no avoiding a bad like an outcome like that. And it was hard because the healing took so long. For a typical birth, you know, if you don't have a fourth degree tear or an episiotomy, you just have like a little bit of a tear, you know, things go well. But I had a tear from where his shoulder got stuck, a second degree tear, and then I had the episiotomy. And it just, it just felt like I was just broken. And something kind of changed after that phone call. I remember, you know, sitting, I remember just like, sitting doing devotions one morning and praying and stuff and I I think I was actually looking out this exact window and I remember just making a decision um to move forward what had happened happened and I couldn't go back and change any of it and I didn't want it to linger over my experience with motherhood I didn't want to look at my son and think about it and God had ultimately sustained me I did not die my baby did not die we were very blessed to have made it through that and the way my doctor described it, it just sounded like something that would never happen again. Honestly, it was, like I said, a perfect storm. And I didn't really want to share my story online because I I was moving past it, but I couldn't talk about it without crying. So I cried a little bit in this story, but like last year I filmed my birth story like a year ago and I couldn't even tell parts of the story without actually crying. So it was really fresh then, um, but now it's in my past and something happened that really helped me heal from that birth. And it's not what you, you would think, like you would think that I would have never wanted more kids, that I would never wanna go through that again. But weirdly enough, I didn't feel that way. I was like, you know what, birth is hard. My situation was extremely rare and weird and difficult, but it probably won't happen to me again. Um, and then when I found out I was pregnant with my son, Troy, I, I honestly wasn't scared. I wasn't scared of birth. And also like so early on in the pregnancy, if you guys have seen my other videos, my pregnancy with Troy was kind of high risk because I had a large subcornea 
chorionic hematoma. And that was like a little bit of a mental battle too, because I had just gone through this really complicated, difficult birth. I felt like my body had failed me and then I'm pregnant again. And it feels like my body's failing me again, because apparently subchorionic hematoma, it had nothing to do with how close my pregnancies were. It was just it just happens to like less than 1% of women. And I had learned later a vacuum delivery happens to less than 3% of women. <laughs> and occupant posterior is about 30% of women. Um, and usually the baby does flip during labor. So to, to go through so much labor, so much active labor and still not have been able to flip my baby, it was just very, very, very rare and uncommon. And so when I got pregnant with my second, um, so soon after my birth with Bodhi, from the very beginning, I was thinking about a cesarean section because like I said, I had the episiotomy and the second degree tear and I, I did not feel like healed from that for a very long time. I was thinking about cesarean from the aspect of Bodhi's birth, my doctor told me should have probably been um, a cesarean section like after those first couple hours they could have tried to flip him manually um we could have tried to do a few other things but it probably should have been a cesarean section and I didn't know this at the time but cesarean deliveries are safer for mom and baby compared to an instrumental vaginal delivery so in the moment I just thought you know vacuuming him out sounds safer than going through surgery but vacuuming and forceps is extremely dangerous to the baby. Like I said, Bodhi had a massive head wound and my pelvic floor got like destroyed. And so um, I learned later, yeah, it's about 30% negative outcomes for mom and baby with instrumental delivery. And then it's 12% negative outcomes for cesarean and then six for like a normal traditional vaginal delivery. And so going into my pregnancy with Troy, I just decided, I will not have another vacuum delivery. Like I was open to delivering vaginally, but I decided if he's occupant posterior again, um, I want a C-section for positioning. And so I tried the entire pregnancy to ensure that Troy would not be um, sunny side up occupant posterior. I did not lounge or recline in a chair for the last like four months of my pregnancy. I was always in the ideal position. I did all the spinning baby stuff and it's really, really rare to have um, your second baby also be posterior. It, it happens oftentimes to first time moms or maybe one of your babies will be posterior, but it's really rare to have more than one. And then we were talking about everything and I was talking about like the outcomes of what a vaginal delivery would be like so soon after Bodhi because you're not really supposed to get pregnant that fast after, um, after birth like you're supposed to take time so your body can heal and that was always the plan but God had other plans <laughs> and because I was pregnant so soon after I was extremely concerned about my physical health and um, how a second birth within 365 days would affect my body and so my doctor you know we had made the decision to try for a natural delivery if the baby wasn't occupant posterior and then she or even if he was occupant posterior, you like still kind of try. But then she informed me like you will tear front to back, which if you know what about birth, you know what that means because of my episiotomy. And I had healed apparently like perfectly for my episiotomy. Everything was looking really great. I was really feeling on the up and ups with everything. Um, after about like four or five months after Bodhi, like things were feeling really good. And just the idea of going through that recovery again um so soon after Bodhi and potentially like really ruining my pelvic floor like a week out from birth he's OP I'm still doing spinning babies I'm still doing everything and he's not changing positions and so we're starting to think like okay maybe it's just like how babies are in your body Kate like that's just how they settle and I had accepted it. I was like, okay, so either I'm going to go into spontaneous labor or we had scheduled a cesarean um, a couple days before my due date. And I had come to peace with it. I listened to an amazing podcast from an OB who got, who like went through every detail of a cesarean. So I'll link that below. So I knew exactly what to expect. You know, C-sections -C honestly aren't the ideal way to give birth. If I had the choice between a C-section and a non-complicated vaginal delivery with no tears and maybe a first degree tear, I would pick that. 
Um, but in the choice of a vacuum delivery or an occupant posterior baby and a C-section, especially like a guaranteed tear front to back, um, I decided C-section and I have zero regrets. Like I said, the baby's already here. So you know what happened, you know where this story is going. So I ended up going into spontaneous labor at 38 weeks, two days, which was actually the day after Christmas. And it was funny because I had said, I had been praying and I was like, oh God, you don't have to like do this for me. But I just really would love to have Christmas with Bodhi, be there for his first Christmas. I don't care if the baby comes later that day. I don't care if he comes the next day. I just really want to be there and not in the hospital um, on Christmas day. I was not looking forward to being in the hospital away from him. That was really factoring in in my decision of whether or not to do a cesarean What because I knew that I couldn't lift Bodhi for a longer time than if I had a successful vaginal delivery. And I also knew my hospital stay would be longer, so I would be away from him longer. But the closer I got to birth and the more I felt just like this growing concern for the health of my baby and the more I just really rem was remembering that giant wound on Bodhi's head from the vacuum and the hours of, of mental and emotional agony that really set me up for a difficult time postpartum, like emotionally and for bonding, I decided like... I I just, I couldn't go through that again. I couldn't go through that again. And it was more and more likely as we were headed to the, the delivery that it would just be the same because I was delivering another boy who was measuring large. And if you have shoulder dystocia, which I almost had with Bodhi, like when his shoulder got stuck, it doesn't sound like a big deal. Like, oh, my baby's shoulder got stuck on the way out, but it is because if there's breakage when the baby's shoulder gets stuck, their arm can break, their uh, neck can get severed, or it can cause brain damage. And because my doctor performed the episiotomy so quickly, thankfully, Bodhi didn't have shoulder dystocia. But sometimes even adults like who had shoulder dystocia when they were born, they don't have like good function in the arm of the shoulder that got stuck and you're more likely there's studies on this you're more likely to have shoulder dystocia if you already had one in birth or a near miss with one and so that was going through my head too and so when we eventually decided okay baby's occupant posterior this was like a couple days before I went into labor and we are just going to do a c-section when you go into spontaneous labor so just come in and we'll do the c-section so i ended up going into the spontaneous labor the day after christmas and it was so weird it was the same thing i didn't think i was in labor i didn't really like have symptoms i just had upper back pain and i wasn't even convinced i was in labor um but my husband was like no you're in labor we need to go to the hospital and i was like oh i'll just go by myself and i'll do a non-stress test you don't need to come you can stay with bodhi and he was like nope um i'm coming with you and i'm bringing the bags <laughs> and it's a good thing he did because we get to the hospital and i was like a little uncomfortable but it was like nothing crazy indeed i had also i had the liquid again so i had another high leak water rupture it was the exact same week in time as bodhi's 38 weeks two days and they checked me out for contractions and dilation. And I was, by the time we got there, um, the, there was another nurse midwife, not the one from last time, but there was another one. And she was like, you know, you guys are probably going to end up going home just because you don't really seem like you're in labor. So we'll just get you out of here really quickly. <laughs> so she checks her dilation. I'm four centimeters dilated. They hook me up to the contraction reader and I'm having contractions three minutes apart. And she was like, <laughs> so they call in my doctor. Thankfully, the doctor on call was my doctor, the one who delivered Bodhi, um, the one who's near and dear to my heart. It could have been three other ones, so I'm really glad it was her. They get me into the operating room, and then I'm in there by myself. They do the spinal, and this time, because I wasn't in such severe pain and delusion and delirium and uh, nitrous, the spinal block hurts so bad. Like, they put it right into, <laughs> into your bone. And he, he had to do it twice because, like I said, I have scoliosis. And so things are, like, a little wonky. So he did it twice. It finally worked. The nurses were so sweet. The one operating room nurse was like, oh, just hold. I'll, I'll stand right in front of you. You hold on to me while he does the needle. <laughs> and I, so people who meet me in real life, like, 
they're, they're like, oh my goodness, you're so much taller in real life. Like I'm a five foot eight woman. And when I'm pregnant, like I'm not a small woman. And this nurse like was tiny, a hundred pounds soaking wet, but I'm like leaning over her, like holding her under her for dear life as he's like doing the needle. Um, and then they swing me up onto the operating room and and it was just such a, it's so weird to be talking about surgery in such a positive light, but it honestly was like people were in there. We were all like having this really good vibe and people were cracking jokes and we were just talking and we were talking about our other kids and Bodhi and like what we were going to name Troy. And the anesthesiologist was talking to me and I was really, really scared of not getting numbed. I had heard horror stories of people having to go through cesareans without being fully numbed. So I was really afraid of that. Um, so I kept like asking him like, are you sure? Are you sure I'm numb? <laughs> and he's like, try to lift your leg up. <laughs> and I couldn't. <laughs> and that's when I was like, okay, I trust you all. So they do all that prep. Husband comes in, he gets to watch the birth and it was crazy fast. Like it was like less than 10 minutes and Troy was out. And they hold him up for me to see and there he is and he's just like got this angry look on his face and it was crazy too like when they were pulling him out the sensation of a c-section is really really weird because you're totally numb but you're mentally present and it, it just feels like tugging when they pulled him out he was a big baby the doctor was like caitlin where were you hiding this baby she said it a couple times and everyone was like whoa that's a big baby and then someone was someone else is like she was only 38 weeks right and they're pulling him out and it's weird it's like this tugging sensation because they're literally taking him out from under your ribs my doctor said when she made the final cut to get to him because they have to cut through a lot of layers of your body like it's no it's no small deal she made the final cut to get to him um he his face was like like right there he was like totally sunny side up not really descended um stuck in the same spot Bodhi was so it kind of confirms our suspicions about like my pelvis shape and everything because like I said, it's really rare to have two sunny side up babies, especially if you're like fighting against that position like I had been for months and months and months. So anyways, they when they pull him out and they're like, he's so big and they had had us all make a guess on how heavy he would be. And I guessed eight pounds, eight ounces. And I was the closest. He was eight pounds, nine ounces. Bodhi was eight pounds, six ounces. And it doesn't sound like that big of a baby, but because they were both early, like they weren't full gestation size and near the end of pregnancy, a baby gains about one pound per week. Those were big babies for 38 weeks. <laughs> and so um, they get him out. Grant's holding him. I get to see him. And it was just it was the experience I didn't know I needed. It was happy. He was healthy when he let out his first cry. Everyone was like, whoa, like that's really loud. He has this like ear piercing cry. When the when the nursing team was like shocked at how loud his cry was, I was like, that's a bad sign because these people deliver babies all the time <laughs> and they think my baby's extra loud. Uh-oh, like Bodhi has this beautiful, sweet little cry, but Troy, mm -mm. like he doesn't cry that much, but when he does, you hear him so anyways he's crying finally and and he's just so sweet and and lovely and I you know they're they're doing a really good job sewing me up and everything's going well it like I know most people who have c-sections it's like an emergency and so unless it's a c-section after you previously had an emergency c-section and an emergency c-section is just such a different experience than a planned one it wasn't like they were taking forever but it also wasn't this emergency rush like get the baby out everyone's worried crying no like my first birth was like that my first birth was like this insane crisis mode situation not this like beautiful moment so with Troy it was just so healing like I got to have a golden hour with him he got to have delayed cord clamping I got to nurse him that first night I felt like mom immediately I got to look in like at his sweet face and bond to do skin to skin and I didn't feel like my body failed me and I didn't feel like afraid I didn't feel like I just survived like a near-death experience I wasn't shaking and broken and and I got pizza later that day <laughs> it was awesome and I I needed that experience and I'm so glad and it was just really surreal the rest of our time in the hospital he slept so amazingly um we took to nursing and 
it was just beautiful. And we were getting these photos from my cousin had come to stay with us to take care of Bodhi because um, she had helped us in the summer with my subchronic hematoma when I couldn't leave uh, pick up Bodhi. So she was sending us photos of him. And I had said to Grant, it was like seeing the photos of him was hilarious because it was like when you get photos of somebody who's on vacation where they're just like, oh yeah, huh? wish you were here too. But they're so enjoying what they're doing. They like kind of forget you exist. That's what Bodhi looks like in the photos. And I had been fussing for months and months and months, worried about leaving him overnight, worried that he would miss me so much, worried that he would be distraught. And then here he is just having the time of his life with my cousin. <laughs> so that was a huge relief. We, I could really be present with Troy because Bodhi was so well cared for. And my cousin, because Troy came two weeks early, she, we had asked that she stay with us um, for two weeks after my due date to help because I had the cesarean and those are, you cannot lift like a 22 pound toddler. And so we had booked her flight for the middle of January. And, but because Troy came early, we got her for like an extra week and a half. It was awesome. So we kind of just settled into life and um, it was just so good. And Bodhi adjusted really, really well to his brother because he's so young. He like kind of doesn't understand. He wasn't old enough to be jealous. He wasn't old enough to even realize Troy was a competing sibling. <laughs> so it was just beautiful. And through that experience, I feel like I healed a lot in the sense because it wasn't the medical like birth side that I really wanted. Like I know a lot of people sometimes have a traumatic birth and then they go the other way. Like they want to do things more natural. They want to do things at home, like away from the medical system. But, but because I felt like with my first birth, I needed a doctor sooner. I needed help faster. I needed help quicker, not less doctors or less interventions. Um, I felt like so good with Troy. Like I felt so safe and, and having to have a postpartum experience where my newborn was healthy and didn't have like a ginormous head wound on his head he was just whole and perfect like it was so good because I can't I just can't explain to you how painful it was as a mother to have this like wounded little baby and that was his first like welcome to the world like here's this giant injury and I was so injured and everyone was injured and, and sad. And then after Troy, it was insane. I healed quicker from my C-section than I did from my vacuum delivery because pelvic floor healing is, is no joke. Like it is so painful. And so three and a half, four weeks after Troy was born, I was lifting my 23 pound toddler, walking. My incision didn't hurt anymore. But I do have to say that first week, I was like, oh man, this is painful. C-sections are not an easy way out. Um, as far as healing goes, they are rough. And thankfully, like I didn't have to labor beforehand or have like a no progression or whatever. It wasn't an emergency C-section. So the, the benefit I had was I went into that healing and recovery from the cesarean with a full night of sleep the night before. I was very... Um, I wasn't exhausted, I wasn't tired, and I was able to really focus. And so it was just a really great launching point for um, for my time with Troy. And, and I think, you know, if the births, if the pregnancies had been farther apart and I had had more time to heal from Bodhi's birth, maybe that would have changed things with how I felt about Troy um, and, want, and how I wanted to approach that. But I'm, I have no regrets. Um, with my cesarean it was just perfect and it was like it was just what I needed and I, I'm just so grateful to the Lord that everything went fine and I I was really disappointed when Troy was um posterior sunny side up because I was like no like I'm I, I want to have a normal birth you know um but I think that this was meant to be and I I just, I felt so much peace with it. I, it's hard to make these decisions, these medical decisions. It's difficult to make like life-changing decisions. And I knew it was the right decision because everything was pointing towards that. And it felt like the safest thing for my baby. And at that point, like I would have rather taken on the difficulty of recovering 
from a c-section like recovering from a hard like surgery then have to watch my baby potentially recover from something like what Bodhi had to recover from that was just the worst and and even worse like Troy could have had shoulder dystocia like it's actually pretty likely um and I also didn't want to go through all of that pelvic floor healing like I had made such progress I didn't want to put myself like two steps back because I had only healed from it like maybe seven months before I gave birth like fully healed and so that is Troy's birth. You can probably tell like how happy I was. Those are my birth stories and it feels really good to share these with you. And I just want you to know what happened to me again is rare, but to anyone who has experienced some sort of birth trauma, your body didn't fail you. You're not a failure. You're not a bad mother. Women who can give birth in two hours home or have a healthy, easy birth at the hospital, you're not less than those people because that just wasn't in the cards for you, you know? I I actually think my births, they did bring me closer to my husband, the Lord, and they were humbling in a way to just be reminded of the fallibility of our bodies. We're not in heaven. My body is not perfect, and, and I shouldn't have to expect that of myself, you know? And so, yeah, that's my story. I'm sorry this was so, so, so long, um, but two birth stories in one video is a lot to get through. So thank you for watching. If you're interested in more of this kind of content, I have motherhood content and I have vlogs where you'll get more of my personal life. Um, please leave little snippets of your birth story below. I'd love to hear it. If anyone has experience with vacuum deliveries, planned cesareans, maybe births that didn't go the way you expected, leave your comments below. Support one another. Love on one another and give you all the peace you stand in need of so thank you for watching if you made it this far i'm impressed i'm very impressed but have a beautiful day my sisters i love you so much